Welcome to Radiology Case Review, Endometrioma. I'm Dr. Dan Koval from Radiologist Headquarters. This episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The beautiful images that you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige Ultrasound Unit. I have three unique endometrioma cases to show you, and I'll review key teaching points throughout. Let's start with case one. This was a patient that presented for follow-up of an adnexal mass. So here we have a large mass in the left adnexa rising from the left ovary, and you can see that it has homogeneous low-level echoes diffusely throughout it. There's also some posterior acoustic enhancement, and we see a thin septation giving the mass a bilobed appearance. We see no internal vascularity throughout the mass when we add color Doppler imaging. And the mass is quite large. It measures up to 11 centimeters on this sagittal image and 9 centimeters on this transverse view. We can also see that the septation is rather thin traversing the lesion. Now here's the sagittal cine clip of that right ovarian mass, and you get a great look at these homogeneous low-level echoes diffusely throughout the mass. You can see why it's sometimes called a ground glass appearance. And we see that septation there extending partially across the lesion. Let's review key points for case number one, and you can also find these in the episode show notes. Now, endometriosis is the occurrence of ectopic endometrial glands and stroma outside of the uterine cavity, so abnormal location. Now, endometriomas, as we saw in this case, represent endometriotic cysts that are confined to the ovary. But sometimes in the setting of endometriosis, extra ovarian implants also occur, which can lead to adhesions and even obstruction. And these implants most commonly occur in the pelvis, but can rarely occur in the abdomen, and very uncommonly even in the chest. Endometriosis is seen in about 10% of women of reproductive age, and the presentation is variable, but often includes some combination of pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, and infertility. Now, in ultrasound, the most specific appearance is what we saw in this case, where you have diffuse, homogeneous, low-level echoes throughout the mass, and that can yield a ground glass configuration. It's also not uncommon to see posterior acoustic enhancement or increase through transmission. Case number two, this patient had a history of an enlarging adnexal mass. So here we have a transvaginal ultrasound of the left adnexa, and you can see the left ovary is quite enlarged, measuring up to 12 centimeters. This ovary actually contains two lesions. We have this lesion here, the smaller one, and then this larger lesion here, measuring about 8 centimeters. And notice that there are homogeneous low-level echoes diffusely throughout this mass. So I'm giving you a clue here that this is the endometrioma. But we also see some echogenic peripheral nodularity. There's no internal vascularity within this mass. We see more of that irregular echogenic nodularity, which also appears to be a vascular on color Doppler imaging. We do see some peripheral vascularity, but that's likely related to the surrounding ovarian tissue, which is normal. Still, we have no internal vascularity within this endometrioma. And now we're starting to catch this second left ovarian mass, which also has no internal vascularity here. It just seems to have some peripheral flow. So what is this? Well, we can see that there are some fine intersecting lines representing fibrin strands giving this reticular pattern, and that's typical for a hemorrhagic cyst. You can see this is also much smaller than the larger endometrioma, measuring only about 5 centimeters. And this appearance is fairly specific for hemorrhagic cyst with these intersecting fine lines. You might also see retracting clot within a hemorrhagic cyst, and here we're looking at a transverse cine clip. Now, here's that larger endometrioma adjacent to it. Notice those homogeneous low-level echoes. We can see there are some incomplete septations. But this one is atypical since we have some peripheral echogenic nodularity, but it looks quite irregular. All right, let's briefly review key points for case number two. So how do you differentiate endometriomas and hemorrhagic cysts? Well, hemorrhagic cysts will again have that reticular pattern of fine, thin, intersecting lines. They also tend to be acute, meaning they'll resolve within 8 to 12 weeks, and they're usually solitary and unilocular. Endometriomas, on the other hand, will be chronic. They'll persist beyond that initial follow-up ultrasound for years, and they can sometimes be multiple or multilocular. Another important feature to keep in mind is that endometriomas can sometimes have peripheral punctate echogenic foci. These foci should have no internal vascular flow, but you may see some twinkle artifact. In this case, though, these peripheral echogenic areas were more than punctate, right? They were kind of irregular and almost looked like mural nodularity. But they had no internal vascularity, and at the time of surgery, this mass proved to be a benign endometrioma. But it is important to keep in mind that rarely, about 1% of the time, endometriomas can undergo malignant transformation. Although uncommon, this transformation is typically seen only with larger masses and in patients over 40 years of age. The two malignancies that endometriomas can most commonly transform into include endometrioid carcinoma and clear cell carcinoma, and these are both subtypes of epithelial ovarian tumor. All right, let's move on to the final case, case number three. So here we have a transabdominal image showing the right ovary, and it's replaced by this large multilocular cystic mass here containing septations and with low-level internal echoes. We also see that there are multiple locules here on the sagittal and transverse imaging. 
The sonographer was thoughtful enough to actually number the individual locules on this image. The cine clip here very nicely shows the multilocular configuration of this particular endometrioma with the thin and thicker septations here. We do see some posterior acoustic enhancement, which again, remember that can be a feature of endometrioma. On this power Doppler image, there's some mild internal vascularity within the septations, which can occur with endometriomas. Now we're looking at a sagittal image of the left ovary, and you can see this ovary also has a multilocular cystic mass within it containing thick and thin septations and homogeneous low-level echoes, so another endometrioma, and this one's located immediately posterior to the uterus. Here we can see the endometrial stripe has a trilaminar configuration, which tells us that the patient is in the late follicular phase of menstruation just prior to ovulation. And this one is quite large as well, measuring about 13 centimeters. And then here we're looking at the sagittal cine clip of that multilocular cystic mass. And again, you can see those thick and thin septations. This one has no internal vascularity within those septations on power Doppler imaging. Now the patient went on to have an MRI of the pelvis, and here we're looking at an axial T1 fat suppressed image. So you can tell this is fat suppressed because normally the subcutaneous fat will be quite bright on a T1 weighted image, but the signal has been nulled. And here we can see that there's a multilocular, very bright mass here in the right annexa corresponding to that initial right ovarian endometrioma that we saw. And there's also one posterior to the uterus corresponding to the left ovary, which is the image we just looked at previously. And these two ovaries are adhesed together here, which is common in the setting of advanced endometriosis due to adhesions. Now here we're looking at the T2 fat suppress series that correlates to the T1 image. And notice that right ovarian mass is very T1 bright and becomes T2 dark. That's known as T2 shading. And this combination is extremely specific for endometrioma. That left mass posterior to the uterus also becomes dark on T2, not quite as dark as that right ovarian lesion, but also consistent with endometrioma. Notice that this mass is not as bright as the free fluid within the pelvis posteriorly. Simple fluid will be bright on a T2 weighted image. Incidentally, here's the normal T2 bright endometrium of the uterus surrounded by the T2 dark junctional zone. We also have a left and a posterior fibroid, which also tend to be T2 dark due to the smooth muscle composition. Okay, let's review key points for that final case. So as we saw, endometriomas can be multilocular and bilateral. Flow may be present in the septations, but again, you should not see mural nodularity containing flow. That should clue you in that you may be dealing with a neoplasm or malignant transformation of an endometrioma. Now, ultrasound is an excellent imaging tool, but for problem solving, MRI is actually the most specific imaging modality for diagnosing endometrioma, as they will typically have this homogeneous T1 bright appearance. I like to describe it as light bulb bright, and then it will become dark on T2 weighted imaging, and that shift from being T1 bright is known as T2 shading. And this was described by Dr. Togashi back in 91 as having 98% specificity in the diagnosis of endometrioma. Treatment for endometriosis varies depending on severity of disease. Surgery may range from laparoscopic cyst aspiration or cystectomy to hysterectomy and oophorectomy ovarian removal if the disease is advanced. Medical management is sometimes also attempted, including oral contraceptives and gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists. All right, thank you very much for joining me, and thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, please subscribe to the video podcast or on YouTube. To see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, click the YouTube community tab or follow us on social media. Until next time, radiology is life.